Hello and welcome to the role of cultural diversity in mentoring. My name is Maureen Johnson and I am the program specialist here at AUCD. We would like to thank you all for joining us today. This webinar is brought to you by the National Training Directors Council. It is the second in a series focused on recruitment, diver, recruitment of diverse participants in USAS, LENS, and IDDRC. Before we begin, I would like to address a few logistical details. First, we will provide a brief introduction of our speaker following the speaker's presentations, then there will be time for questions. Because of the number of participants, your audio will be muted throughout the presentation. The chat box, however, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation via the chat box on your webinar console. You may send a chat to the whole audience or to the presenters only. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the AUCD website following this webinar. There will also be a short evaluation survey at the close of the webinar. We invite you to provide feedback on the webinar and also to provide suggestions for future topics. Please, joining, please join me in welcoming our presenters today, Dr. Deborah Vigil from the University of Nevada, Reno, and Dr. Janice Enriquez. Dr. Vigil is the Associate Professor at the University of Nevada, Reno in the Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology and Director of the University Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment, Co-Director of the Nevada LEN Program and Chair of the Nevada LTSAE state team. She is currently the CDC's Learn the Signs Ambassador to Nevada. Dr. Enriquez is an Associate Clinical Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics at UC Davis Mind Institute. Dr. Enriquez is currently the Training Director for the NorCal LEM Program and the USED Multicultural Council Representative at the Mind Institute and the Multicultural Council Secretary at AUCD. She is the co-director of the Maternal Child Health Careers and Research Initiatives for Student Enhancement Undergraduate Summer Program, also known as MCHC, Rise Up at UC Davis. I will now turn the microphone over to our first presenter, Janice Enrique. Okay, so um, before we start, actually, um, Janice and I would uh, just like to um, have a, a moment of silence and to say a few words about what is happening uh, currently in our country. Um, something that's really, I think, uh, hurts our souls and our minds and uh, in remembrance of, uh, of all of those um, that have had such difficult encounters with, with the police and um, all the things that are happening. And I just want to, I just want to have a list of words here, uh, I mean a list of names uh, to help us just put this in real context. Rodney King, George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, who was selling cigarettes, Breonna Taylor, Jamar Clark, Philando Castile, Ahmed Arbery, Stephen Clark, uh, who had a gun, who had a cell phone that was mistaken for a gun. Okay, Janice, did you want to say a few words? We want to thank you all for joining us today on a Friday afternoon and um, welcome you in, in this webinar. Um, with everything that's happened thus far with us all being in a state of pandemic and um, the racism that's occurred more recently and the impacts that that has on each of you and your colleagues and your community, 
um, our thoughts are with you and um, we invite you to um, share your thoughts and discussions at the end of this particular webinar as it pertains specifically in hopes of improving cultural diversity and mentoring. Okay, next slide. And these are our learning objectives. Um, so uh, we want to identify the theoretical concepts of mentoring underrepresented individuals that can be applied to, to LEND trainees and how that theory might help in terms of mentoring. And uh, we want you to be able to discuss the benefits and challenges in developing cross-difference uh, mentoring relationships, the mentor-mentee relationship, and apply practical ideas that can guide faculty in mentoring for LEND trainees from um, underrepresented backgrounds. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I, I don't think, well, I don't think we can have a discussion about mentoring cultural diverse individuals without raising issues of identity because the truth is, is that different uh, trainees may be at different stages of their own identity development. And, uh, and when I'm talking about identity, you see on the, uh, on the table there that there are different identity models based on race. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and, uh, and more recently, uh, uh, Forber Pratt from Vanderbilt developed a model for disability identity. Um, and it's important for us as mentors to understand the history behind the trainees that have brought them to our training program. Um, so I'm just going to go kind of quickly through this. Um, there's the, of course, there's Erickson's, uh, Erickson's stages of, of psychosocial development, but also when we look at racial identity, there is racial identity was from Helm and um, Janet Helm. And uh, there's a contact status where um, these individuals don't see themselves as racial beings. And then they become, eventually they become aware of that through their own uh, 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 cross-racial cross -racial interactions. And then there's an in integration status that acknowledges that this individual, he or she is white because there is this internal struggle, struggle that racism really exists uh, and they may over identify with blacks or become paternalistic or retreat to a white culture. There's a pseudo independence uh, status where uh, there is this intellectual acceptance and curiosity about blacks and whites and, and uh, cross racial uh, uh, interactions then become possible. And then there is um, and autonomous status where uh, there is this knowledge about racial difference and similar similarities and can really accept them in the in the people of color identity model from cross um, uh, there's uh, these there are attitudes to blackness and and whiteness and there is a pre-encounter status where the individual wants to fit into the majority by acting and thinking and behaving in ways that lessen the value of being black. And there's this uh, encounter status where there's a question their identity, their identity becomes, they question their identity because they realize they don't fit into either minority or a, major, a majority group. And then there is an immerse, immersion, immersion status where they embrace and adopt a sense of black pride and, um, and they may, be, may reject anything else. Uh, and then there is this internalization uh, commitment where there is the security finally in who they are uh, now and they're open to relationships with, with, uh, with others and there is a, they can gain a sense of action and, and activism. And with a biracial identity model by uh, Poston, uh, there's a sense of uh, of being unrelated to either ethnic group. And this really occurs in childhood. And then uh, they begin to feel pressured to choose one racial group or ethnic group identity over another. And then there's um, this categorization where they have choices influenced by the status of their group. And uh, there's this, um, could be this enmeshment or, or denial, and there's this guilt and confusion about choosing an identity. And, um, and then finally, there is this appreciation of uh, mul um, multiple identities. And then there's this integration where there's this sense of wholeness 
uh, integrating um, multiple identities. And then what you have um, from Forber Pratt is with disabilities is that they become, there's this acceptance that they be, uh, um, they become or they're born with that disability and they're, they accept it. They have uh, the friends and families that accept their disability. And then uh, finally with their relationship status, they uh, can meet others that are similar to them and they can engage in conversations about who they are and their disability. And then they learn ways of being in the group. And then, uh, and then they adopt who they are and uh, adopt the shared values of that group. And then there is... Um, this engagement status. They can then become a role model. They help others to develop that status and they begin to give back to, uh, to the community. Next slide, please. So then um, the other thing, issue is that, uh, that needs to be considered for mentoring purposes is, is cultural competence. And, um, there's something interesting about the history of the concept of cultural competence in that it was first introduced by uh, T.L. Cross in, uh, and colleagues in 1989 who wrote a monograph about improving services uh, to children of color who, are, who were uh, severely emotionally uh, disturbed. And that, at that time, that's what they called it. Um, and subsequent to the monograph, um, there were different educational, public, and, and uh, private agencies that started to use this framework to address uh, cultural and linguistic diversity in the healthcare field. So this whole concept of, of cultural competence really came out of the world of disability. And so now it's come full circle. So uh, Cross's definition of cultural competence is a, is a set of congruent behaviors, attitudes, and policies that come together in a system agency or those professionals to work effectively in cross-cultural situations. And so there was a list of, you know, what is important for uh, uh, cultural competence, that is being able to value diversity and uh, being able to uh, assess your own cultural value. And, uh, and then there are, of course, communication fundamentals, and we're gonna be talking about some of those throughout this, um, uh, webinar today, and then uh, there needs to be institutionalized, uh, institutionalized cultural knowledge, so that um, so that the uh, the area where you're working in, the the agency that you're working in, can uh, begin to discuss uh, what's important not only for um, those clients that you might be providing services for, but for the uh, for whoever you're working with, for mentees and for mentors, the same. And then there is being able to um, adapt to diversity. Next slide, please. So in this discussion, we were hoping to share with you um, and focus on cultural concepts related specifically to mentoring. But first we have to address what mentoring is and create a shared meaning for it. Mentoring is this individual dyadic um, and reciprocal relationship between an individual who is more senior and more experienced and more knowledgeable about a particular area, or usually a faculty member, and um, a less experienced individual, and in our case, we're referring to a trainee. Um, their relationship builds over the course of time, and there's consistent interaction uh, over a period of time and indefinitely beyond the mentoring um, relationship beyond graduate school. So in focusing on underrepresented trainees, we also wanted to identify who we're identifying in the literature and in the communities that we see uh, and practice in um, as underrepresented. So if we look at the National Institute of Health and National Science Foundation of um, definition of underrepresented trainees, um, this includes un individuals from underrepresented backgrounds who have disabilities, who are disadvantaged for a variety of reasons, both educationally and economically, and, uh, and in addition to women. When we look at uh, the racial and ethnic breakdown of individuals, this would include African American or Black individuals, Hispanic Latinos, uh, American Indians or Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and other Pacific Islanders and individuals with disabilities. Again, 
within the context of um, graduate school studies over a, the course of a 10 year span, you can see that um, those individuals who I just had mentioned are largely reflected um, in this particular chart. So for example, um, in terms of racial and ethnic breakdown, the predominant composition across a 10 year span includes, includes the majority of individuals includes white Caucasian individuals um, with individuals who are from uh, Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native, Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, multiracial or Alaska Native um, individuals who are uh, comprised of the minority of, of students in this sample. And uh, so one of the things that I, I think that we all need to be considering is um, that our trainees are going to be going out into, into the, predominantly into the healthcare field. And um, so what we have is when we look at different professions in primary care, you can see that, I mean, of course, all these, I mean, all of them are going to be predominantly white. And um, I think that uh, one of the things that as we go through um, this webinar today is considering with our trainees, um, helping them to understand that uh, they're gonna be going into a field where it's predominantly white and um, that they really do need to understand what's happening to them and uh, what they're feeling and you know, particularly that, um, you know, if they do come from uh, an underrepresented background, um, that we uh, are able to provide them with some skills, um, not only as trainees, but to move on into the future. And so, uh, and, and these, are, these are fairly new. I mean, some of these are like from 2018, 2019. Um, so in terms of where we're at, uh, there's a lot of work to do for us uh, to try to um, get more of underrepresented individuals into, uh, into the workforce. So when we look at the groups whom we are um, hoping to focus on, um, we identified from the AUCD um, and NEARS data within the past year from 2019 uh, to 2020, the composition of LEN trainees and USAID trainees. And I apologize to our IDBRC group that we're more focused today on LEN and, and USAID um, trainee, trainees, but we will include suggestions for all trainees. Um, so as you can see here, the composition within the past year across lens across the nation uh, reflects the composition of trainees um, from racial and ethnic backgrounds. It's consistent with um, underrepresented groups, both reflecting the definition of the NIH NSF and also within graduate programs over a 10 year span. Similarly, within our USEDs, um, the composition is very similar to what we had uh, seen before in the previous slides. So the majority of individuals is, um, uh, of trainees are white, and then the minority of individuals are um, individuals from underrepresented communities. And then um, because we don't have cross-sectional data or intersectional data on um, people from across different cultures. We uh, also have information about trainees with disability. And you can see here that across LENS and USAID, there's a significant minority of individuals who have a disability who we consider as self-advocates. So some of the challenges uh, that our mentees have coming from uh, underrepresented backgrounds is uh, the first one is social, uh, social iso uh, isolation as they're trying to navigate uh, in this um, unfamiliar environment. And this really has an additional effect in that the knowledge that's necessary for the mentor to mentor the trainees really can't be developed because uh, here is this individual feeling uh, really isolated and not being able to understand uh, exactly how um, they get around the system and, and work within the system. And then, um, yeah, they can be asked a lot, and this is, I mean, of course, this has happened to me, you know, I mean, when I first came to, to the University of Nevada, Reno, it was like a heyday that, you know, I could then be on all these different committees, and I could be doing all this other stuff, and really taking away from my time as uh, someone who needed to publish and do some of the other things. Uh, so doing extra things, and it can then uh, lead to feeling more isolation. 
Um, and then there is that, uh, that difficulty in negotiating micro address, uh, aggressions and uh, stressors that are uh, related to race. And we're going to be getting into that a little bit more. But um, these are some of the things that we really need to be thinking about with, uh, with our trainees. So how else do trainees see themselves? Um, you'll see across these characteristics, this is very common for all trainees, but in particular for underrepresented trainees, they experience this at a magnified level. They see themselves as outsiders or different. Uh, they need to constantly prove and reprove themselves to meet a very high bar. They need to maintain multiple cultural and social identities that are different oftentimes from that of their mentors. Their question on the legitimacy of being in a program, and this of course creates a high level of cognitive load and anxiety for uh, our underrepresented trainees. Trainees want to see a mentor who's viewed like them. Um, they, they unfortunately experience communication differences from their mentors, um, oftentimes from their own cultural values that are clashing with that of um, the academic and um, uh, context that we typically have. And they may also experience uh, double jeopardy, in which case they come from one minority group, not just one minority group, but multiple minority groups, which creates um, uh, risk for them to um, not succeed as much as other trainees. They also may experience imposter syndrome, stereotype threat, isolation, mental health concerns, and decreased productivity. So why is this so important for us to be addressing and to continue to improve in the future? The reason why is because creating a diverse and inclusive and supportive community enhances our research productivity, our teaching effectiveness, our faculty recruitment and retention, satisfaction, it decreases attrition in the long term, and it creates a more positive organizational climate. So I wanted to call your attention to a special series of articles um, that were edited by Drs. Wyatt and Belcher, and their focus was on supporting underrepresented trainees. And while our hope was to focus this literature on LEND trainees, the reality is that the literature does not solely focus on LEND trainees. It crosses disciplines, it crosses across research and clinical work and um, all of the work that we do with our trainees. So with that said, um, they did note that you know, underrepresented trainees may hold a significant insight into the complex ideologies and solutions to help with our health disparities that persist that valuing cultural and linguistic diversity, as well as considering multiple cultural identities and intersectionality within the mentoring relationship provides that foundation that fosters self-efficacy in the long-term and a successful research career for scholar, scholars and faculty. And that achieving diversity in science really hinges on cultivating this new generation of talent and promoting full inclusion of excellence across the entire population. Yet time and time again, and decade after decade, we continue to experience disparities in mentoring. Um, because I'm a clinical psychologist, I looked in the clinical psychology literature, and you'll see that 60 to 70 percent of psychology graduates who typically have a research mentor do not identify as having a mentor. This is very consistent across medical schools um, and medical students. The NIH Biomedical Research Workforce Pipeline notes that mentorship was among the top three most frequently noted pipeline issues for underrepresented students. In the long term, in terms of supporting our faculty in these positions from um, underrepresented communities, they experience social isolation, exclusion from network, unintended biases from their own colleagues, um, have to traverse through really difficult social societal norms, have multiple cultural taxation, um, ride the fence between multiple cultures, between academic cultures and their own familial cultures, and uh, they're perceived as not being as valuable in scholarship um, that's relevant for underrepresented groups. And they may also have a lengthier promotion of trajectory and attrition. Oops, sorry. And so this is a call for those of you who are mentors, those of you who are training directors and work with your directors closely and your faculty. So we know that effective mentoring relationships have been shown to improve motivation and retention of students, increase self-efficacy, increase research productivity, and prepare our trainees for future opportunities um, within the context of a more socially supported network. But we know that without a really consciously honed set of communication skills, these mentor relationships will fail to achieve their potentials for our underrepresented trainees. 
So um, in 2015, Robert Wood John the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, convened a panel of, of mentoring experts in uh, what was called New Connections in 2015. And they did uh, a webinar um, with uh, some objectives that included identifying factors that optimized or uh, challenged a mentoring of both uh, underrepresented minorities and uh, under and non underrepresented in, uh, scholars. And then um, another objective was to identify how mentors uh, handled issues of race uh, and ethnicity and dynamics and work, work life balance and discrimination. And they also wanted to discuss uh, killers of, of mentoring, including job demands, time management challenges, and, and absent mentees. And then the researchers for uh, uh, there, were, there was a group of researchers that then ended up um, looking at this webinar and they did a qualitative analysis of the, um, of the webinar itself, which is real, really interesting. Um, and when they did this, what they found was um, these challenges with the mentor-mentee uh, relationship. And one was uh, uh, having conversations about race and identity and, and, and ethnicity. And I think that that's something that probably uh, that happens a lot. And I think that that's something that um, as, a, as a lend right now that we need to be looking at that a little bit closer and how do we have those conversations. And I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because how do you even start a conversation like that if you're say if you're white and you have a black mentee or you have uh, um, you know someone who is uh, a self-advocate or you know I mean I think that that's something that um, it's, it's a wider discussion I think for all of us to have um, and then um, another challenge is uh, addressing those challenges that are in and outside the mentor mentee relationship. You know, what is it that is going on? You know, so if we take social identity into consideration, you know, it's like that's outside of the mentor mentee relationship. So how do you, you know, how do you, um, how do you address that? How do you, how does the mentor, uh, if they don't feel like they're competent in really discussing some, uh, uh, race with, uh, with uh, the mentee. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of things there that all of us, um, I think that we can um, begin to address and I think would be a really healthy thing for as, as a lend to be able to come up with a way that uh, all of this can be discussed. And, um, and then um, another challenge is how can the mentor discuss how to address others' biases? Because the truth is, is that what's going to happen is, is that, you know, those little microaggressions are there. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it's just really interesting because um, here I was in a, in a, uh, a staff meeting and, you know, just sort of out of the blue, someone called me Mama Sita, you know, it's like, and I mean, here I am, I've been doing this, you know, for quite some time. It still really surprised me, you know, and it's like, and I still haven't talked to that person. Um, so I need to develop those skills as well. And I think that uh, that is something that can be talked uh, through with a mentee is that those kinds of things can happen. Those kinds of things uh, can happen now that can happen when they, when they leave uh, uh, their, uh, their LEND program. So I, I think there's a lot of work for all of us to do. Um, um, a, a mentor really needs to be providing some career and employment advice and where can they go? What can they do? What's going to happen to them? Um, and then, uh, and then uh, a challenge I think for this relationship is that, you know, maybe the mentor has an idea of what is a, an ideal mentee. Um, and, you know, that is something, again, uh, you know, this is, you know, what came out of this is that there are these challenges right here. And I think that these are uh, some things that we need to be thinking about in our own heads, um, how we're going to overcome some of these challenges. So Janice, did you, were you gonna be discussing this one? I think you were. Um, I don't have that on mine, sorry. 
My head to do it. Okay, we'll just move on. Okay. So um, there are some basic mentoring values um, for the mentor and the mentee. And uh, these behaviors uh, can be discussed with the mentee and uh, to discuss awareness and uh, experience related to, uh, to each of these. So the mentor needs to be uh, talking about what their own experiences have been as well. So there needs to be mutual respect and that is respect of each other's culture and language and life differences and those opinions. And they may or may not agree, but that there has to be this understanding that there's insight into reasons behind uh, each other's beliefs. And then there needs to be honesty in, in establishing that safe place. Um, and that is if the mentee is struggling, it may help to discuss or role play what has occurred. So that might be something that will be helpful to be able to go through uh, that in, in a very intentional way. And then, um, you know, discuss conflict management and what are those rules of engagement to, uh, to, manage, uh, to manage that conflict. And I think that part of uh, the, the LEN curriculum and, you know, you said, and we, we all discuss what that, um, what that conflict is and being able to um, overcome that conflict. And so there could be that conflict between the mentor and the mentee. And so then, you know, that's a, a wonderful opportunity to be doing some, uh, um, some modeling of, of uh, managing the conflict. And then there needs to be transparency, transparency, in, and that's being clear about behaviors or, or, uh, or acts that can harm uh, the LEND experience. So really, you know, discussing with a trainee when there has been something that has gone on so that um, all of this gets out in the open and you uh, discuss all of this. And of course, uh, that is that, that, uh, uh, Confidentiality, uh, of course, is, is, doesn't really have to be explained much. I mean, we all know that. Um, and then there is that recognition that uh, the individual is the um, expert of their own experience. And it's possible that the individual may have some attitudes or beliefs um, and they might be defensive or they might be pessimistic. So um, in that sense, it is waiting to see whether the, uh, the mentee is ready to discuss it and sort of put your toes in there every once in a while with the mentee. Next slide, please. So uh, when we think about strategies for uh, the mentor-mentee relationship, there is a framework and that is at the beginning is being uh, is setting up a collaborative development of expectations oh, for for, uh, for personal good weekend. See you later. Um, uh, is setting up a collaborative development of expectations for personal and uh, and professional goals. Really sitting down and with the train uh, with the trainee and and allowing. Uh, that discussion to occur. And then of course, I, I've said before, that is mentors sharing their own personal experiences and those, their experiences of exclusion and inclusion and revealing uh, strategies that are uh, related to disempowerment and, and being burnout and defining boundaries about, about personal issues. And, you know, being able to talk about uh, race and, and bias. And, and again, this is, uh, uh, this is, a hard one because the trainee may think it's inappropriate. I mean, I think it's really difficult to, uh, to bring these personal issues uh, and discuss these personal issues. And, um, and they may feel like that it may hurt their uh, advancement in some way. So it's being able to uh, discuss and acknowledge unconscious bias. And um, this might function uh, this unconscious bias that might function in a, in a white system. Um, and it can help the, many, the mentee to discuss negative experiences and then build their own strategies as well. And so having a mentor who discusses and models these coping strategies really helps the mentees to avoid adverse impacts on their own uh, psychological health and uh, not only participating in LEND program, but also in their own future uh, professional goals. And finally, uh, with skill uh, building and support, the mentor 
uh, needs to introduce the mentee to other faculty and, and, other, uh, and other individuals and promote the mentee's goal. And then the trainees can recognize, they begin to recognize their own strengths and weaknesses. So they uh, begin to feel more comfortable without being embarrassed. And in this way, the trainee can ask for support. And there's difficulty, say, with finances, you know, uh, and can there be a consideration for additional supports in some way? So there, I mean, it's, it's being creative in, in ways that, uh, um, that could really be helpful for the mentee and, and mentors can reach out to other faculty that might help the trainee with a particular issue or a particular skill. Uh, and this discussion can, uh, can be in the context of, uh, also in the context of when they finish their LEND trainees. And so um, this all sets up the trainee for their future and wherever they're going. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, systems level change, because I mean, one of the things that we have to think about is, um, it, you know, it's great to be able to uh, discuss individuals and, um, but we really are looking at systems level change. And so this is where, you know, we have to have that drive towards getting that. So, uh, um, and, and this is something, again, I think that, you know, for us to think about as, as a lend and you said that, you know, what we can do. And uh, one is organizing gatherings to challenge and, uh, and, and change implicit biases. So the mentors can work with a network of colleagues to discuss how to have those conversations and, and get advice. And maybe uh, you'd want to refer the mentee to someone out there in the LEND world that may, might be able to help. And so developing mentoring programs. And so um, Janice is gonna be going into some more, um, some theory that uh, might be really helpful and, and uh, is gonna review some resources. Um, and then we need to consider, of course, my, uh, microaggressions that can uh, undermine how the individual fits. Um, there's forming a village, you know, have, uh, have we asked our trainees if they want to meet others from the same background to get, uh, to get support and, uh, uh, mentors can share different strategies with, with others. So again, you know, this whole concept of blend and, and you said really coming together. I mean, particularly now in the situation that we're in, um, and then there's individual recommendations so that mentors need to make a decision about providing holistic mentoring. So it's not just training uh, uh, or act for uh, not mentoring for, for training spe uh, specifically for academic purposes or for you know, our training in the LEND program, but also for personal adjustment uh, where the trainee may end up in some environment that uh, is going to be difficult for the um, for the trainee to, to navigate, and the mentor should recognize their own limitations, and uh, and reach out to others when they uh, when that occurs that they don't understand what's going on. So uh, there's also uh, mentoring. Uh, mentors should share their own experiences if it's relevant, and having feelings of isolation, their own feelings of isolation, and attitudes and beliefs. And this is a good model for the trainee and uh, provides a greater sense of belonging uh, and, and strengthens the, the bond between the mentor and the mentee. And as a mentor gets to know the mentee, it's, being pay, it's, it's paying attention to what the trainee is saying and those statements because it could reflect um, some difficulties. It could reflect that imposter syndrome and it, it could reflect internalized racism. So really being paying attention and then, you know, discussing with them what their feelings are. Um, and it helps uh, the trainee uh, when they're seeing that the mentor has struggled as well, they can see that there can be a resolution if, if the men mentor has gone through some uh, difficulties and have had microaggressions, for example, and so the trainee can then see that there are resolutions to this. Um, having a buddy mentee, you know, being able to hook them up with others, um, and at times it might be necessary to, to suggest some psychotherapy. Um, and then again, um, The men, it, possibly the mentee should uh, seek out other 
mentors as well so that when they are going into their uh their ne the next phase of their life is being able to seek out uh, a new mentor so we thought we'd review um culturally congruent mentoring both models and theories with you and um for this particular section, we actually had to pull quite a bit from the academic literature in terms of research mentoring as well. So this will apply to all trainees. So generally speaking, many of us do not receive formal mentoring training. Um, and with that said, there are also many, many models across the field of mentoring uh, and many paradigms. So there's not one agreed upon model um, across disciplines. However, within many of the models, they do focus on the mentee's achievement, emphasize the mentee's emotional and psychological support needs, um, their need for direct assistance with career and professional development and modeling, and the need to develop personal and reciprocal relationships with their mentors, and that the fact that mentors just have greater experience, influence, and success over the mentee's um, trajectory. Additional general mentoring theories um, include the academic persistence and career attainment model, social cognitive career theories, science development, science identity development and social negotiation models, social capital perspective and career stage mentoring. Those are all broad mentoring theories that have been integrated in mentoring programs. However, the next section will focus more specifically on areas and aspects that um, influence and positively impact um, mentors from mentees from underrepresented backgrounds, both racially, culturally, um, in terms of disability and economic status. Um, Wyatt and Belcher had, again, developed a special set of articles last year highlighting the importance of supporting underrepresented mentees. And to understand their experience, we should talk a little bit about um, where they had come from. So um, Gail Wyatt is uh, historically in the field of HIV and AIDS research, and um, she was invited in 2005 by the NIH to um, be part of a research panel of experts. Um, and from that, they, fo they formulated the African American Mental Health Research Scientists Consortium Working Group, which is important for many of the training grounds today. Um, from that program, um, Harold Belcher, who has mentored over 600 underrepresented trainees um, through Kennedy Krieger, um, she participated in this program and graduated, and both of them came together to develop a special uh, journal focusing on underrepresented trainees. So within a mentor's wheel, there's a general mentor wheel, um, and in, the, in this particular set of articles, they focused more on promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion in the mentoring relationship. Um, for those of you who have a developmental background, Wyatt had identified a modified Bronfenbrenner model, which highlights inclusive mentoring. So on the outside circle, the most um, outside circle that reflects societal beliefs uh, in Bronfenbrenner's model that relates to environmental and impacts on an individual. Um, societal beliefs such as implicit bias and colorblindness um, within the environment, within mentors, uh, should be addressed within the mentoring relationship and should be really something that the mentor reflects on and addresses within themselves. Within the middle circle there, um, impacts to the individual include imposter syndrome, internalized racism, stereotype threat, and code switching between languages they're familiar with in the home environment and then um, languages they switch to in an academic environment. And at the core of this is really the trainee um, and how all of these systems impact their self-esteem and their self-confidence, which then impacts their trajectory in a professional capacity. Um, Lonzi had also identified a different developmental model for mentoring underrepresented scholars. And um, this was applicable for people who are in the biobehavioral and health sciences. Um, but they felt that we need an explicit and flexible um, model and guidelines to be working on. This model was adapted from the American Psychological Association Task Force, and it really is reliant on the mentorships relate the mentor and mentee's relationship uh, being a dynamic, really dyadic interaction. Um, it also focuses more specifically on the mentor's ability to engage in reflective analysis of their own skills, their life experience, and to recognize 
both the mentor and the mentee's strengths and weaknesses to strengthen this mentoring plan. This is a really interesting article because it goes through four different stages of a mentee's um, progress over time and the relationship they have with the mentor. So in the first stage, which they entitled the launching stage, this is the stage wherein mentors and mentees become acquainted with each other. They identify um, goals together. There's an affective and cognitive component to this. They build trust. Um, with this too, the mentor also uh, must address their uh, ability to commit to this relationship of mentoring, as well as their own microaggressions or biases or stereotypes um, they may project onto the mentee within this relationship. In the stage, uh, the second stage, which they entitled Active Growth and Learning, there is um, a meshing and concordance of the mentor and mentee's cultural experiences, and it's really important for them to be addressing this throughout their um, academic and um, personal development over the course of that time. And then within the third and fourth stages, um, the mentee progresses to become more independent, and the mentor helps them, the mentee, to develop a network of support. Um, this, is, this article is helpful to look at because across these developmental stages, it also identifies specific challenges and strategies for success. So for example, within the first stage of development, um, within this mentor-mentee relationship, addressing challenges such as microaggressions, biases, uncertainties about each other's cultures, and um, any potential barriers is very important. And they also address strategies for success. You'll see time and time again across articles after article, there is always um, the importance and emphasis to address um, cultural sensitivity, uh, culturally safe environments, and to be able to defer to the trainee as their own cultural expert when they bring their own experiences into this relationship and this mentoring relationship. To be mindful that um, one culture that they may be from also, um, uh, they may be from multiple cultures and so they, have intersectional identities that they bring to this relationship. And to recognize the additional and constant pressure that's um, experienced by trainees, um, as well as the systemic issues that need to be addressed um, from a mentor standpoint. When we look more specifically across different domains um, related to underrepresented trainees, um, within, for example, the Asian American, some Asian American trainees may experience a fundamental value difference in their own um, hierarchical, or they defer to somebody who's higher than themselves in collectivistic values. So they think of themselves as within a group, which may clash with more egalitarian values. So um, that which is typically associated with more um, academic settings of the need to be more independent and more autonomous and to um, support your own self-advocacy and, and communi communi communicating your successes. Um, other authors have talked about the conversations of race and ethnicity and making space for those types of conversations that's really integral to the mentoring relationship and making time for those. Um, others have also focused on cultural humility, particularly with the HIV research um, and how to identify how cultural beliefs influence the mentoring practices. And then within the LGBTQ community, there's been a study that was done by trainees who were from that community, um, and they emphasize the need for mentors to educate themselves, to do their own research about this community, to use active skills and strategies to engage in discussions and dialogues with their trainees about how this impacts them and to really advocate for their trainees. Again, you'll see a very similar model by another author, Thomas, um, who emphasizes both systemic um, changes that must occur as well as changes within the faculty um, mentor and also the mentee to help um, with this relationship. So with that, then, we'd like to focus this last section on mentoring tools and tools that could be helpful for you in your practice and that of your faculty. One program that's been developed and fairly well established is the Culturally Aware Mentoring Program. Um, the reason why this is pretty well established is because it's theoretically driven um, from theories from multicultural backgrounds, uh, feminism, critical race, motivation, and institutional transformation. And within this particular um, program, they've found really good effects uh, for mentors and mentees after two years. 
Um, the mentor gains intrapersonal, interpersonal cultural awareness and skills to recognize and respond to cultural diversity issues in mentoring. They, the mentor may realize their own racial and ethnic biases and sensitivities, um, communicate better with the research team and the mentee. And you can see on the right side here, various aspects that have been beneficial for the mentor that have then impacted the mentee's trajectory. A second program that we wanted to highlight is through UCSF. And this is by the work with Johnson and Gandhi, Gandhi and Johnson. And they have, um, in addition to addressing self-efficacy within the general mentoring model, they've also created supplements to address unconscious bias, microaggressions, communication strategies, and a mentor consultation clinic. And you can see here from their data across different domains that were measured, in particular focusing on addressing diversity, um, the middle bar being pre-workshop, the third bar being post-workshop, um, you'll see a significant and statistically significant difference in improvement in a mentor's ability and capability to address these concepts within their mentoring relationship. Um, the last item we wanted to turn you towards is um, some content from the book of Daryl Sue. Daryl Sue is a psychologist at Columbia and He's been cited as um, on national surveys, two national surveys as being one of the most prominent and influential thinkers in the field of multicultural um, development and experiences. And he talks about the belief that dialogues are on race seem to be purely ex intellectual exercises in our typical academic um, context. And it really minimizes the expression of emotions that's strongly associated in race and um, which then in turn allows, forces us to lose an opportunity to explore what it really means to individuals, what it means to trainees, and what it means to mentors. And I, by extension, this does not only apply to race, but obviously applies to all cultures and cultures that are underrepresented. In particular, race talk on the part of people of color is about bearing witness to their lived realities, their personal and collective experiences, and the academic protocol that we surround ourselves in that we're really well entrenched in really discourages these sources of information into the conversations which we have. So at this point, we just wanted to share additional resources for you. These are very easily accessible online resources which you are welcome to peruse through. Um, the article which we didn't talk about in depth, but which was cited by Os Osman, I think, is um, from the Brigham Women's Hospital Mentoring Curriculum and Toolkit. And they have a really wonderful, very detailed curriculum um, about what they've done to address diversity within their mentoring relationships. Um, of course, the Georgetown Center for Cultural Comp National Center for Cultural Competence has some wonderful resources. Um, for those of you who are in research, National Research Mentoring Network, Neural Online Professional Resources, um, Diversity uh, Program Consortium. There is some information from the NIH uh, within the Moving It Forward um, link there, information throughout the American Psychological Association on mentoring underrepresented students, as well as information on pathways to science.org. So with that, that is the end of our content for today, and we will welcome questions for the last seven minutes. This is a reminder that you may enter questions for the presenters in the chat box. You can um, find the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. It is in between the features that say participants. And this webinar will be available as well as its recording in the transcript. I do see one question um, from Sandra. She asked, can you provide an example of when you have changed a person. That's a really good question, Sandy. Um, you know, I was just in contact with Harold Belcher a few days ago, and I think one of the samples when you've changed a person, when you've really influenced an individual, is when your mentee becomes a mentor in sharing this information related to diversity with other people. And so I think that's one thing that we can think about in the future. 
Well, I, you know, I did have a, a particular experience, and this is um, where in our program in speech pathology and audiology at UNR, um, we never had one black master's student <clears throat> that came to our program. And, um, you know, here was this person really, really struggling. And um, I ended up, up and, and she did, I mean, she did, you know, she had a 4.0 in her undergraduate uh, class classes. And then, and then she came into the master's program and, you know, she ended up talking about how difficult it was for her and that you know, all these other people around her had all of these different supports. And, and we, I mean, we really went through this um, a lot. And I, and to some degree it was, uh, me talking about you know what my experience had been and and some difficulties that i had and so at that time i really didn't i didn't know about you know really that kind of real classical mentoring i mean this was really coming from the heart because i ended up saying to her you know you are going to be the first african-american that has graduated from this program and uh and you are then going to be a mentor yourself for all of the individuals that you're going to be seeing. And so, you know, she, you know, she talked about um, how difficult, you know, she came, grew up in the projects. At some point she was living in her car during, uh, during her graduate program. And, um, and I ended up reaching out, getting some help and, you know, showing her how she can go out and get help. She said she didn't want to seek help, you know, and then, um, you know, after a while, she began to understand and, you know, it was tough. And she kept saying, this is tough. This is tough. And I just kept saying, I know, I know it is. Um, and uh, there was at some point where I said, I'm not going to let you quit. I'm just not going to let you quit. Uh, because this is important. This is important for, it was important for her. It was important for our department. It was important for uh, the clients that she'd serve. And, uh, you know, she, she finished that program and, and she went out and she's out there working and she is successful. So, I mean, I think that you know, really being able to talk about race and, and allowing her to talk about those differences and crying. And then I did put her in contact with um, uh, getting some counseling and, you know, she did, but it was really talking about race. It really was. I have another question from Christine Lau um, about with COVID-19 making everything virtual and typically people of color and other marginalized identities have less access to technology, do you have resources or thoughts on virtual mentoring and providing adequate support for those that don't have the right technology? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know, Janice, I, if you can sort of address that. I mean, you know, one of the things that's happening, I think, for all of us is that we are um, learning how to live in this world of being uh, on Zoom right now. So um, I, don't, I don't have any resources, but um, I think that... Um, you know, as all of us go forward, if we can have some sort of discussion like this, I think, you know, having another webinar about looking at um, how do we do this and how do we how do we go forward? I mean, I think that in, in my area of speech language pathology, we were pretty good at, at, uh, at doing um, online therapy. Um, and I know that psychology is doing a lot of that um, as well. I see a question here from Rebecca um, in terms of, can you talk about making errors as a mentor? 
I think there's lots of opportunity to make errors throughout mentoring and as a mentee, and there's no right or wrong or right way to go about this, which is why there's not precisely one way to go about this. Um, I think personally, in terms of what I've seen in, in making errors, you know, not allowing that opportunity for discussion with the trainee. I've seen trainees through our pipeline program come in who have full scholarships at other universities who are exceptionally talented, um, who experience racism and discrimination from very young ages, and they just need space to be able to talk about that and how to balance that within their work as a trainee and their future graduate work. And, um, and not allowing those kinds of discussions is certainly an error. Um, and in other cases, too, there are many opportunities for error and discussions where, um, you know, um, it's hard to foster some of these topics in, in conversations because it is so anxiety provoking. Um, there are some models that are coming out. Uh, one in particular I wanted to highlight was from my colleague here, Pooja Hooks, who is developing a training um, for mentors with specific strategies on what to do um, in these situations where there's very um, heated discussions around um, you know, race and um, culture and um, difficulty resolving some of that. And Rebecca mentions, I agree, owning up to an apology is key. And that is part of um, Dr. Hook, Hook's um, strategies within her programming. Well, and then sometimes just saying, well, you know, we're going to be doing this together. We're not sure. And, uh, and, uh, and I think being able to include uh, the mentee in resolving some of that as well. I mean, I think, you know, from a personal level, I think I would, uh, you know, of course, owning up that you don't know everything, but you know, asking the asking the mentee what you know what what do you think? I mean, how, you know, let's have this discussion together. I mean, I do know that with a, a young man that came from um, uh, high functioning um, autism university program, very very bright young man, um, and I used to see him a lot. Um, for counseling purposes and um, and then he ended up coming in and getting services from our clinic. But uh, one of the things that I used to say to him was, well, you tell me what it's like to be autistic. I don't know that. You know, let's talk about that. And, um, and then we ended up having some great discussions. So it was, you know, allowing him to, to teach me as well. I think that was a real eye-opening experience for me. I'm recognizing it as 202, and I know that it is Friday afternoon, and many of you are also in the East Coast. Um, and we wanted to, again, thank you for your time for participating in this today. And please, please continue the discussion with your own um, sites and your directors and um, your faculty members. And if you are interested in learning more about multicultural topics, I invite you and our leadership team invites you to the Multicultural Council to join us for a meeting. Um, we would be happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, thank you all again for attending this webinar. I also want to give a special thanks to our presenters as well for this very thorough and relevant um, topic. This webinar is has been recorded and will be archived at AUCD.org. Please take a few minutes to complete our survey. You can find it in the chat box right now. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone.